Hello and very good morning. I hope everyone is doing well and always in high spirits despite these difficult times we're all in. My name is Willie from FPCI. Today, I'm having the honors to serve you as the master of ceremony of today's event. It is also my pleasure to welcome you to the kickoff of Europe Virtual Box Road to Europe Day 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, every year on the 9th of May, people of Europe celebrate the Europe Day. The Europe Day is a day of celebration that traces back to the same day on the year of 1950. On that day, French Foreign Minister Robert Schuman declared an idea that marked the coming together of European countries and led to the creation of European coal and steel community, which is known as the beginning of the European Union that we know today. It is said that solid, the solidarity of production by European countries makes war not only unthinkable, but impossible for the European uh, Union member states. Therefore, European Day is a day of celebration of peace and unity. This year marked the 71st anniversary of the Schuman Declaration, and every EU institution in the euro and its offices all around the world are organizing a number of activities for people from all ages to celebrate this happy day and raise awareness about the European Union. Although we are refrained from celebrating uh, Europe Day in a traditional physical manner this year, FPCI remains grateful that we are still able to celebrate this day of peace and unity through virtual platform with the European Union. We also are joined with hundreds of members of FPCI University chapters across Indonesia and the general public via YouTube live stream. Ladies and gentlemen, today uh, we are also joined with His Excellency Ambassador Vincent Picat, Ambassador of the European Union to Indonesia. Ambassador Vincent will give a special lecture entitled Europe Day, the EU at 64, What's for, what is uh, for next year. Uh, welcome Ambassador, we hope you are doing well. We also have with us founder and chairman of Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, Dr. Dino Patijalal, who are co-hosting this day of celebration with the European Union. Welcome, Padino. Hope you are doing well uh, and uh, healthy. Before you, we move you. further, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to encourage everyone who are watching from YouTube to stay tuned until the end because we will have the Europe Virtual Talks quiz and you will have the chance to win interesting prizes from the European Union. The quiz will be held on Kahoot, and I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with Kahoot. However, uh, please allow me to uh, guide you on some import important instructions so that you can prepare to join the quiz. The first instruction is uh, to enter the gampin at the kahoot.id. So ladies and gentlemen, please prepare a second screen or a second device so that you can uh, put in the, your browser, the uh, website kahoot.it. Uh, and then uh, there will be a campaign that we will be announcing uh, later on through uh, the screen. And uh, next will you. Uh, you will then be asked to enter a nickname, ladies and gentlemen, and your nickname should be the order confirmation number, which you can find on the ticket that was sent to you through Eventbrite. The order confirmation number should look like this on your ticket. And it should look like this on the email sent to you through Eventbrite. Uh, thank you very much, Wahyu. Uh, furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, we encourage you to share your moments with us from this opening session by tagging at FPCindo and at uni underscore Europa using the hashtag EU for you and Europe Day 2021 on your social media posts. Please also submit as many questions as you want at the YouTube live chat box because we are gonna have a question and answer session uh, later on. Let us begin our great discussion today by watching a video from the European Union.
Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we would like to invite Dr. Dino Patijalal. Okay. Now, ladies yes. and gentlemen, we will have another video to uh, show from the European Union. Okay, is it my turn to talk? Uh, um, not yes. yet, sir. Uh, there oh, is one yet. more video from the. Okay, okay. Thank you, Padina. Thank you very much. Now, with a further ado, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to invite Dr. Dino Patijalal, the founder and chairman of Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, to give this welcoming remarks. But you know, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Willie, and thank you so much to all the FPCI team who are organizing uh, this uh, event. And I want to welcome uh, Ambassador uh, Vincent uh, Piquet. Uh, Will, will be sharing with us his views on how the European Union has evolved uh, over the years. And I also want to thank him because the, the EU office in Jakarta is one of the closest partners for FPCI, right? Uh, we always work together because we find a lot of our issues are aligned. Right? And this is the first time also that we are going to do EU week uh, for FPCI. Yeah? I know the EU, they do this uh, a lot of times in the past every year. I remember attending your, uh, what do you call it? Uh, your receptions, the EU receptions, always full of food and, and uh, you know, uh, and everything else. Uh, but because of COVID, that can't be done. Right? Uh, so, you know, it's going to be an interesting talk today. Uh, the Euro Europe uh, has uh, always been, uh, you know, a place of historic significance uh, for the world. Uh, a lot of troubles were created in Europe uh, early on in the in the century. Uh, you know, the World War One started uh, in Europe. World War Two uh, also started uh, in Europe, and a lot of European colonizers. Uh, uh, control the world yeah uh, including in indonesia uh, by uh, by the dutch colonizers and so on but uh, after those two terrible uh, or a number of terrible historical episodes uh, uh, in the second half of the 20th century uh, europe really began to change um, uh, it not only rebounded and rebuilt uh, after the ashes of world war ii but uh, uh, there was also a very interesting experiment on regionalism, right? Which happened in the 50s uh, with uh, first with the European coal and steel community, uh, which eventually evolved uh, into the uh, Europe, the European Union that uh, we see today, right? But back then there was really hardly any example, if not uh, zero example of how to build uh, uh, successful regionalism. Right, um, and what is interesting about the European experiment is that uh, you know a lot of these countries had a lot of nationalism, right? And you, you know you had the, the German uh, nationalism, you know you have the French nationalism, you know a, a lot of the countries had nationalisms. But how how do you overturn that uh, to develop uh, a place where they still have uh, you know nationalism in terms of being proud of being you know, German, being Dutch, being French? Uh, and so on, but uh, they also 
would be proud to become European uh, and uh, would uh, agree to to common norms, right? Uh, and and would would act together, right? As as a region, right? So so that's not found anywhere else uh, in the world, right? Especially not in the uh, 1950s, right? So it was very interesting experiment, uh, and as it turned out, the, the European experiment became one of the, actually you know one of the most successful uh, in the world i think there are only two in my view uh, successful regionalism which is uh, european union uh, and asean yeah uh, i think the, the the difference is that uh, at least two things uh, one is uh, european union uh, is still growing right uh, it was 28 uh, and then britain left and now it's 27 but there are other candidates uh, that are on the lineup, you know, I think including Turkey, right? And then I think somewhere down the line, maybe Bosnia, Herzegovina and, and so on, right? So it's still growing, yeah. Whereas in ASEAN, uh, we are at 10 countries and only one possibility, which is uh, Timor-Leste, right? So ASEAN will only grow uh, to uh, become 11 at some point, but more or less now it's established uh, with 10 members. And the other difference is that uh, uh, ASEAN uh, is a regional organization uh, with political diversity. So you can embrace uh, any political system. You can be a democracy like Indonesia, or you can be a socialist country like Vietnam or Laos, yeah, uh, or a monarchy like, like uh, a Brunei uh, and so on and so on, right? Uh, so, so in ASEAN, uh, you have political diversity yeah, in terms of political systems, right? Uh, but in the European Union, uh, you, know, you, you, you must be a democracy and you, have a, you must have a market uh, economic system uh, and, and that qualifies you to become uh, part of uh, the, the European Union, right? Uh, and, you know, uh, they, 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 they're quite strict on abiding by, by the norms uh, of, of uh, what makes the European Union. Uh, so, for example, if anything like Myanmar, you know, were to happen in, in European Union, uh, and Vincent can, can correct me if I'm wrong on this, I'm sure that country would be expelled from the European Union, right? Uh, if, you know, if, if kids are being shot, 700 people are, are being uh, murdered uh, by, by the regime and, and so on, you know, because there's there's uh, very strict standards of uh, adherence in, in the European Union. So uh, it's, it's very uh, interesting and, and successful and strong case of regionalism and how it has uh, uh, you know, shaped not only Europe, but, but, but the world. And I think uh, of all the things to be said about European Union, uh, I think uh, their being champion of multilateralism is the one which I think uh, is most important because uh, definitely today, uh, the, the kind of global challenges that we see, uh, we really need a strong multilateralism to resolve all these issues. And I'm glad we started with the uh, uh, climate video. Uh, and to be honest, if you ask me what would be the most important alignment between Indonesia and the European Union, uh, I think the, the, the best one would be on climate change, right? Uh, European Union is way ahead uh, on its climate commitments. Uh, they wanna achieve net zero emission by 2050. They're pushing all countries uh, to adopt stronger measures uh, to reduce uh, carbon emissions. And meanwhile, for Indonesia, we, I think we, we are not there yet. You know, uh, our, our climate commitment needs to be stronger. Uh, we haven't uh, increased our uh, NDC, you know, the, the national climate target is five years old. Uh, you know, the last commitment was to reduce by 29%, but that was announced in 2015 and all other countries has increased their ambitions. And we have not announced our net zero uh, uh, target uh, as well, right? Uh, and, and, you know, there's really, I think, uh, you know, FPCI chapters that the, the, the most ambitious thing, uh, the most important important thing for FPCI you know, is the climate uh, agenda. So, so I think that's going to be an important uh, potential cooperation between Indonesia and EU. So I'll stop there. Uh, I just want to say happy uh, EU day to uh, Vincent uh, and thank you for being a good friend of FPCI. 
uh, and I hope uh, more and more PCI friends are, will visit uh, Europe once uh, the COVID pandemic is done. And, and please listen to all the ambassadors that are going to be speaking uh, to, to us in the next week. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Pat Dino, for your insightful words. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure that everyone in the YouTube uh, are eager to listen to the uh, special lecture by Ambassador Vincent Picat entitled Europe Day, the EU at 64, what is for next year? However, right, ladies and gentlemen, before we get to that, I would like to encourage all of our audiences who are watching from YouTube to submit as many questions as you like in the live chat box. Our committee will fetch out the best questions and I will read out uh, the questions to Ambassador Pinson later on in our question and answer session. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome um, His Excellency Ambassador Pinson Picat to present his special lecture. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Willie, for the introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be joining you this, this, this morning. Um, I greet all the participants. Um, sitting um, in um, Jakarta, but particularly also in other places in, uh, in this vast country um, uh, of Indonesia, uh, in other parts of Java, in Sumatra, Sulawesi, and, uh, and, uh, and, and beyond. So, um, uh, I'm, I'm even told that there is uh, at least one participant from Malaysia. <laughs> that is a, it is a great pleasure for me because um, as um, uh, I was posted there as, as the EU ambassador um, uh, for four years in the period uh, 2008 to 2012, and uh, I always uh, have uh, fond memories of uh, of my time there, both as a professional and um, and and privately. Um, so, um, a greeting to uh, Dr. Dino uh, Pati Jalal, uh, the chair of uh, FPCI. Um, Great respect for your work uh, with uh, this fantastic network of, uh, of young, dynamic people interested in, um, in international uh, relations um, in the region and global levels and, and who uh, in, the, in the several um, um, uh, events that I've had uh, with, uh, with you and FPCI uh, colleagues, uh, have always struck me as extremely engaged in world affairs, uh, in global matters, public matters, public good matters, uh, uh, like the climate, uh, as you say. And uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely um, uh, great to be uh, dialoguing with you um, on this occasion. Uh, you're right, we'll be working with FPCI throughout uh, uh, this week to, ce to celebrate our Europe Day. Um, the EU's National Day. It's a bit of a misnomer, but it doesn't matter. Um, it's uh, the day where we celebrate the start, celebrate the start of um, the EU's um, uh, integration process. And uh, uh, the National Day, the Europe Day, is on the 9th of May. And up to and including the 9th, we have a series of activities, including with FPCI's and as Dr. Dino has said, uh, uh, nine other EU uh, ambassadors, ambassadors of EU member states based in Jakarta uh, will be joining you as well for a very open uh, and informal dialogue uh, session. So it's fantastic to have you as a partner uh, for that. Um, the Europe Day uh, marks uh, this declaration made in 1957 by the, uh, the former, the then French foreign minister, Robert Schumann. Um, his name alone suggests uh, the interconnections, the cultural and historical in interconnections uh, within Europe, Schumann being uh, not only uh, the, uh, the last name of this French foreign minister, but also uh, the name of, uh, of one of the greatest um, German uh, composers of classical classical music, and um, he he kicked off what he said kicked off um, this process of integration. Um, the fact that it happened clearly shows that um, in other uh, the other six founding uh, member countries 
of the EU, a similar sentiment existed um, that that integration was needed. We're talking here about uh, a moment in history which was only five years after the Second World War, uh, which had ravaged Europe. We were in, in ruins, um, physically, uh, morally, psychologically, economically. Um, so something was needed to get out of that and to move on and to rebuild, to recreate um, uh, the Europe uh, for, the, of, for the future. And that's what, uh, what was done. And um, as, as Dr. Neil said, uh, it resulted in various, um, um, through various intermediary steps um, in the European Union as we have it now. 27 members uh, in a, um, um, a, a region where the citizens can work, um, travel and um, do business uh, freely uh, across national borders um, without showing your passport or being passport checked um, on, the, um, uh, on those national borders. It does uh, give um, a tremendous uh, sense of freedom uh, in Europe. It does give a, uh, um, a lot of potential for people to develop their persons, their careers in the way they uh, think best. And um, it creates a tremendous bond between Europeans. And um, so ha hence uh, our happiness to, to have this and to, um, to, uh, to talk to you about it a little bit um, about what's in store for the coming year. Um, you may be puzzled by the title of my, um, uh, my talk. The EU has 64. Um, everything will become clear in the, second, in the last chapter of my talk, chapter 6. Um, why I chose 64 rather than 71. Uh, because uh, as the, the number, 71 is the number of years since the Schumann Declaration. Uh, 64 is the number of years since the uh, signature of the first big uh, e treaty uh, for the, of the EU, and that was the Treaty of Rome. And I will reveal everything later on. Um, I'll start with um, some of the, the, the this brief, I hope, discussion of the, the topics on our agenda for the coming year. Now, number one is clear. Um, it's the same as the one for Indonesia, and that is COVID, 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 COVID. Battle the pandemic at home and abroad. Um, uh, without getting the pandemic under control, uh, there will be no lasting um, economic recovery possible. Uh, there will be no lasting uh, resumption of uh, normal or at least a new normal uh, kind of life. And uh, there will be lasting, uh, no lasting um, uh, resumption of uh, people's uh, normal lives. And uh, we're still in a difficult spot uh, in Europe uh, with the pandemic. Um, there's a, a rather mixed picture between member states. Um, with the number of incidences of, uh, of, of the virus and the number of deaths. Um, however, we feel that um, we may be um, turning the corner very gradually. In a number of member states, uh, the numbers have started to decline somewhat. It's too early to um, uh, declare victory, but uh, we are hopeful that this is the beginning of a, of a trend. Others still have to um, make that turn around and, um, and, um, uh, and so there's still a little bit of an uncertainty uh, about um, um, how to do this. Of course, it's the, in many respects the same sort of methods as you see in Indonesia. Uh, the social um, and 
protection measures, the, the sanitary protocols, the medical protocols, uh, the three M's, um, and 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 the like. Um, travel restrictions, uh, some um, restrictions regarding intra-regional or uh, travel and travel between member states, which requires um, tests and certificates and so on, and is limited to essential uh, moves. Now, we expect that to, to uh, go back to a certain normality before too long, because we have a lot of confidence in our vaccination strategy. And uh, it started very difficult, with great difficulties, vaccination, vaccinating 450 million people uh, in 27 different member states. Um, it's a big, big challenge uh, in any circumstance, certainly because nobody has ever done that uh, around the world. Uh, it's a totally new experience so um, but we've come out of the teething problems and uh, we have now been able to secure a steady supply of vaccines and that makes us hopeful that um, if all goes normal uh, normally we will have vaccinated 70 70 percent uh, of our adult population uh, by Ju July or at the latest August. Now, when that happens, it, then we will have uh, established a herd, herd um, community and, um, and a new normal uh, could start uh, taking shape in a, in a durable, durable fashion. Um, of course, the uncertainties are, exist, as I said, uh, also in the shape of the new variants uh, that are around and what they can do um, to a country is, uh, is so uh, tragically visible in India at the moment. Uh, you can only feel tremendous sadness when you read the reports. Um, so being wary of the vaccines, uh, the variants, uh, uh, setting up new testing um, of the genomes that can identify these new variants is a key task that we are working on um, right now. Um, battling uh, the pandemic at home in our uh, strong, strong conviction has to go hand in hand with helping partners abroad um, battle that uh, the same pandemic. Um, the European Commission President uh, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, herself a, a medical doctor by training, has said it time and time again, and that is, we nobody is safe until everybody is safe. And for us, that is not just a, a, a good slogan, but it's also something we live by and uh, that we uh, put into motion um, in our immediate neighborhood, Northern Africa, in the Middle East, uh, the Eastern neighborhood, um, but also further down um, in the Sub-Saharan African region, in Latin America and in uh, Asia, and that includes ASEAN. Um, the European taxpayer, that is the um, has put together um, um, 38 billion uh, euros worth of assistance um, for third countries, grant assistance, untied grant assistance, that is to say, we give the money for a specific purpose, battling COVID, but without strings attached um, as regards who implements, who executes the projects. Um, 38 billion uh, from the EU budget, but also from the budgets of, uh, of the individual member states. Um, so working together as EU with EU member states has become uh, a very prominent mode of uh, our work. We call that Team Europe. Um, Team Europe is also active in ASEAN. Uh, we have raised for ASEAN countries 
uh, 800 million euros for the 10. That includes 200 million euros for uh, uh, Indonesia. Uh, some of that is grant money, uh, about 20 million euros. Uh, and the rest, 180 million euros, is, uh, is lending uh, for um, the renovation and strengthening of two large hospitals in Indonesia, one in East Java and the other in uh, South Sulawesi. And uh, the loans come from France and from Germany. Um, the other big um, international um, uh, help that the EU is giving is to for vaccination. Uh, we have chosen very consciously for the multilateral track for doing that, not bilateral one, um, which, if you look at it objectively, has become on occasion intertwined with uh, what is called vaccine diplomacy. So using the vaccines for also for uh, ulterior uh, political objectives. No, that's not our mode. Our mode is the multilateral one through the UN-sponsored uh, COVAX facility. And uh, to which the EU has uh, donated um, uh, 2.6 billion euros. And the EU here is again the EU institutions, but also the EU member states. And, and that makes us the single biggest um, vaccine donor of COVAX up to, up to now. Indonesia is benefiting from uh, the COVAX facility as well with, um, for about 12 uh, and a half million um, doses of, um, of vaccine. And the last way in which we will uh, show solidarity, and that's not the case yet, but we, it will come uh, certainly in the second part of this year, is that the EU and the EU member states uh, will um, provide um, uh, the vaccines that we have bought but do not need. Uh, so the excess quantity of vaccines um, uh, will uh, be uh, donated to uh, third country partners uh, in the second part of the year. And that uh, should, um, I believe, uh, very much uh, relieve uh, the, the stress of uh, third countries in obtaining um, the um, uh, vaccines. So that is our external aid effort. Um, going back to the uh, internal matters, um, evidently uh, COVID pandemic has made us think uh, and has made us aware that we are as EU, or at least we were as EU, not prepared for it uh, at all like everybody else, but um, that is no consolation. Uh, and um, uh, so we have to think as EU and EU member states how to better uh, prepare and be ready with um, whenever a, a similar disaster uh, strikes again. And this is one of these interesting developments that you see at the moment that uh, the area of health uh, is on the one hand uh, totally the remit of member states, that's what our treaty says, public health is the remit, is the responsibility of individual member states. Um, what you see now on the other hand is that public health has become one of the most prominent um, areas of work uh, for the EU uh, to take on, simply because of the situation in which we find ourselves. And this, we will be doing in, in public health things that were un inconceivable even two years ago. And um, it just is an example, I think, of the ability of the EU, um, despite the, uh, the, the treaty being what it is and remaining what it is, being able to respond uh, to new situations. Um, with the support of the member states, evidently, they're key in this, such decisions. And, um, and but as long as that's the case, as long as the member states decide uh, together with um, 
the EU executive that something is needed, um, we are able uh, to act. I thought that was an interesting point to note uh, on the day, um, around the day of uh, the Schumann Europe Day. Chapter, that was chapter one. Chapter two, the economic recovery. Like in Indonesia, this is the other big ticket. And uh, it's conditional upon a, a durable um, control of the pandemic. And, um, and recovery we need. Um, in fact, in a sense, we need it more than does Malaysia, that's Indonesia. Uh, because our... Um, um, GDP uh, decline uh, was larger than, than was uh, Indonesia's. 6.2% um, recession last year, uh, which, is, which is massive. And uh, even the first quarter of this year, we uh, witnessed um, a, a minor recession, 0.6%, um, with some countries above um, in the black so to say above zero and but others still below um, nevertheless um, while uh, we um, uh, uh, if we assume that uh, the, the pandemic gets under control then for the rest of the year we, we expect a fairly serious rebound uh, to happen and uh, with 3.7 percent uh, on the on the year total for 2021, and about four percent uh, uh, next uh, next year. Um, there's a lot of savings um, in people's bank accounts. People aren't spending uh, um, uh, like here, and um, so one can anticipate that the moment uh, the situation uh, opens up. Um, there will be a tremendous amount of uh, uh, economic dynamism uh, coming out of uh, out of society. So, on the whole, we are quite confident that we can uh, get into a very positive growth uh, track um, uh, 2021 and and after, provided the uh, pandemic gets under control. Um, but we have still a period to bridge. We have to uh, help companies who are extremely hard hit um, in sectors such as transport, uh, aviation, tourism, um, weather this um, storm. Um, basically, what we're doing is subsidizing wage bills and, um, and, and so forth, uh, so that workers are not being uh, dismissed. Um, uh, the, uh, you can't do that eternally, evidently, because it does cost money uh, to the EU, but also to the uh, member state budgets. And it is a fact that um, the uh, financial support that uh, EU and the EU member states are giving uh, to, to companies um, makes us run into debt, and into debt levels that we've never had as ever since um, the uh, financial crisis. So, so all the gains we had made since the financial crisis um, have essentially vanished and will have to be uh, repaid and recovered um, uh, in the coming uh, uh, years. Now, the EU agreed a tremendous, um, enormous um, recovery plan um, with um, amounts of money that we, uh, we could barely conceive of uh, uh, previously uh, under the EU uh, heading, 1.8 trillion euros. I have no idea what the rupee I equivalent is, um, but it's, an, it's um, 1.8 trillion euros is 2.0 trillion US dollars roughly, um, if that makes it easier. Um, so, tremendous uh, amount of money. Um, of course, money means nothing unless you use it uh, positively and make it deliver results. And that's the phase we're in right now. All member states are submitting 
uh, to the European Commission, our executive branch, uh, the, their recovery plans, and um, uh, in order to obtain the funding, uh, the European Commission will assess the plans, uh, will be discussed then in the Council of Ministers, uh, where the member states come together for taking decisions, and there they will be uh, approved. Um, very intrusive kind, kind of work, evidently, if you start scrutinizing plans submitted by one or the other member state, and um, to test if this is um, the plans are good uh, for um, receiving EU money, uh, that is uh, not an easy thing uh, to accept in principle uh, if you are uh, at, uh, at the receiving end of uh, the criticism, which it sometimes is, when countries have to readjust their plans. Uh, but it just goes to show that there is this willingness among member states uh, to um, have their uh, sovereign policies uh, scrutinized in a multilateral regional framework and, uh, and in order to uh, be able to contribute to the larger um, goal. And uh, so a very important lesson learned there is also uh, the uh, amongst member states and the EU institutions is the need to coordinate our economic policies uh, of nas at national levels to a higher degree uh, than we did uh, before. That is, I think, certainly a lesson learned post-COVID. Um, second lesson learned uh, is about, uh, about resilience. Um, post the COVID uh, made us aware that we lacked certain strategic and essential industries um, in Europe. Uh, it made us aware that we were very, very reliant on um, global supply chain, uh, chains uh, that, um, uh, of course, lead to a lot of efficiencies uh, for firms, just-in-time production and, and supply lines, uh, but it also creates vulnerabilities if the system somehow, for whatever reason, comes to a halt. And that's what it did with COVID at some point. Uh, and um, so that vulnerability is, of course, not acceptable for any country uh, not a, and for, not for a regional uh, unity such as the EU. So for the coming year, I anticipate that thinking about um, the, uh, the creation of a stronger self-reliance of reducing our vulnerabilities uh, to global shocks uh, will be a, um, a, a key uh, uh, task and a key activity uh, in the interest of, uh, of making uh, the European economy um, more crisis resistant. And um, whether it concerns um, pharmaceutical um, production or the, um, um, these, the products, uh, the half products that the pharmaceutical industry needs, or whether it concerns uh, products that at some point uh, we just discovered we didn't have production of. And that one example, very striking example, is batteries for electric vehicles, for other electric equipment. Now, those are crucial for uh, our green agenda. And, uh, and within a very short time, the EU has been able to ramp up a tremendous uh, production capacity for batteries uh, that uh, to help um, reduce our vulnerability and over dependence on outside suppliers. Apologies, Ambassador. Yes, we have. <laughs> yes. Apologies, Ambassador. Yeah, we have uh, a, a limited time and we have so many questions in our YouTube live chat box. And uh, oh. we hope, yeah, <laughs> we hope you uh, can deliver uh, a conclusion from us. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Okay. Um, I'll be brief. <laughs> Thanks for the uh, suggestion. Um, 
the third point is um, is the, the green agenda and um, and uh, simply to say that uh, for us our recovery uh, effort is is a green recovery uh, the money that the member states will be receiving uh, for the recovery uh, will be a uh, have to be spent on at least for 30 percent on green development and many member states will go beyond that um, in order to bring us to uh, the uh, large green goals that we have put for ourselves and um, one important goal is of course to deliver uh, a, a very significant con contribution to the, uh, the global climate talks uh, happening in November um, in Glasgow. Uh, for that, for those talks, the European Union has increased its um, contribution uh, by 15 percentage points, up from 40 percent CO2 costs to 55 percent uh, by the year uh, um, 2030. And um, so that is a massive, um, massive increase. Um, the global climate talks will are tremendously helped, of course, by the re-engagement of the United States. Very good to see that. Uh, climate envoy uh, John Kerry was in Brussels, I think, less than two weeks after he he started um, in uh, in January. And um, we um, are very very keen to. Uh, promote uh, other countries, particularly G20 countries, to, like us, uh, increase the, uh, the targets. And here, of course, uh, in Indonesia is a very important part of us, and we very much hope we can convince Indonesia to uh, increase its um, ambition level as, as well. Um, Two things to bear in mind, uh, that uh, the European Union's green policy and climate policy has external ramifications. In other words, there are aspects, there are policy measures that will affect uh, the cooperation with our partners. Uh, two examples, uh, one is the carbon adjustment mechanism that the EU will uh, implement in order to avoid what we call carbon leakage. Um, the, meaning that EU manufacturers produce green goods uh, but um, suffer from unfair competition from goods coming from outside uh, that were produced in ungreen methods, carbon leakage. So that is certainly something that we will have to discuss in detail, not only at the WTO but also with our bilateral partners in the coming year. And the second uh, big task is in the area of agriculture. Uh, I was personally surprised to read that uh, about a third uh, of the global greenhouse gas emissions are produced in agriculture, in the agriculture sector, and in Europe is no exception. Uh, so we have to include that sector very hard um, in uh, our climate approach. And um, that too will uh, may imply uh, some implications for our trade policy and um, and we um, uh, will have to discuss it also with uh, Indonesia. Um, so far for the green side. F My fourth point is about foreign policy and um, in the coming year uh, we will have to continue to face up to the fact that Today's world is a rather troubled one. Um, of course, the, uh, there were dividing lines between uh, the major powers all along, uh, but it, it's also a fact that the COVID crisis has accentuated those dividing lines. It has deepened rivalries and um, it has sharpened differences. And in many respects, the EU finds itself in, in the middle uh, of some of these. And um, so we have, will have in 2021 a major foreign policy agenda um, with, in order to try and um, uh, rebuild um, or strengthen uh, our major partnerships with the US as well. And so far so good. Uh, we have seen a tremendous development, a tremendous dynamism 
ever since the uh, 21st of January uh, in our uh, relations. Um, and in a couple of weeks' time, uh, the uh, EU-US summit uh, will be held um, um, to uh, take stock and further plan that. Um, secondly, China. Um, without a doubt, a tremendously strong and an important economic part, market for us. Uh, but as our high representative of the EU foreign policy, uh, Joseph Borrell has said, uh, China is um, a competi uh, an economic competitor. It is a systemic rival. And at the same time, it is a, a partner uh, for global public goods. Um, so our desire and intention is very much to try and number the number of topics on which we can cooperate with, with uh, China. And, um, but at the same time, we will have to face up to some major differences uh, that we have with China, for instance, on Hong Kong and uh, on human rights situation in Xinjiang. Uh, and of course, there is the, uh, the situation in the South China Sea. Uh, but this will be a major, major agenda for us. And very briefly on Russia, uh, now you may have read in the press um, in the past couple of weeks, uh, all the things that have developed showing that we are in a, in a very negative, uh, negative sort of spiral with, uh, with Russia. And um, um, three days ago, uh, high representative of the EU in the European Parliament said that um, the EU's relations with Russia are now at its lowest point since the Cold War. Uh, so that is a very, very stark uh, observation. And so uh, at the same time, Russia uh, is our big partner on the East and uh, it is a European country. Uh, um, and uh, it, we have a long, long, long history with it. So we will wish to try and rebuild that um, in the coming year. But at the end of the day, in foreign policy, it takes <coughs> two to tango. Um, lastly, uh, coming back to Asia, in the Pacific, um, two weeks ago, uh, the EU foreign ministers adopted um, um, instructions, uh, guidelines for the drafting of our um, Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, I think it's a very doc good document. I recommend it uh, 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 for reading uh, to you. You find it on the website. <laughs> and um, very important to stress that this is a, um, a, a strategy that is not aimed against anybody. It is not exclusive of anybody. It is inclusive of everybody who uh, can join the EU on a number of consensual topics. And um, so it's a very flexible approach um, and in that sense. Now, um, ASEAN centrality, very strong. ASEAN is our brother or sister uh, uh, organization, uh, as you like. Um, uh, and so we will certainly um, continue to engage very strongly with ASEAN and uh, work uh, to implement the strategic partnership that EU and ASEAN developed. My fifth point, I'll, I'll be extremely brief on that, EU Indonesia, <laughs> getting briefer and briefer. <laughs> uh, EU Indonesia, um, two big ticket items uh, for us in the coming year. One is to make um, decisive progress on the SEPA free trade uh, talks. Um, can we conclude them in the next year or not? Uh, maybe not uh, just yet, but decisive progress certainly we, we wish to make because we do see the SEPA as a tool for recovery, uh, economic recovery for us, but certainly also for Indonesia. Um, the SEPA will produce for Indonesia um, uh, when it, uh, by the year 2030 5 billion US dollars of GDP extra um, year after year. So GDP 
means jobs, GDP means uh, wages, and and um, and uh, also thanks to technological know-how. So SEPA, free trade, is one. And the last uh, is the green agenda. Um, uh, Dr. Dino has mentioned it as well, the priority as he sees it, and I agree with him. Uh, this is a top priority with this vast country, with this vast population, this vast economy already now, and certainly if you look uh, to the 2045 perspective, um, this is a part, uh, partner that uh, has to play a very prominent role um, uh, more and more uh, in the green, the global green agenda. So we wish this year uh, to try and build up a partnership for sustainable growth with 2030 GDP um, uh, benchmark year, evidently, but certainly also looking beyond. Now, my chapter six, and that's the last chapter, and um, the EU at 64. And I chose by 64, uh, which is the, the anniversary of the Rome Treaty, because in Europe, many uh, people retire when they're 65. So my title is the EU at 64. Can we retire when we turn 65 in 2022? Now, you know that my answer is going to be no. Uh, but I know that you won't take a simple no for an answer, and, and you're right about that. So uh, let me just a few reflections. Uh, the EU uh, needs to ask itself continuously why, why it exists, whether it serves uh, the interests uh, of the member states, whether it serves the needs of the member states, whether it serves the interests of citizens and of the needs of citizens. Now, yeah, how do you answer such a question? Um, of course, partly it's politics and opinion polls. And the uh, opinion polls, the recent ones, show uh, that there is a rising popular support for the EU, despite the crisis, very interesting. So there is a rising trust in EU action in a, in a whole range of, um, of, uh, of uh, uh, policy areas. Um, and uh, EU, uh, but the EU population, EU citizens clearly want more EU rather than less. Um, take the euro. Um, citizens feel reassured about the euro. It's, it's been a very reliable currency ever since uh, it was launched as cash uh, on the 1st of January 2002. Uh, we'll have the anniversary next year, 20 years. And, um, and there is no single serious political party any longer, uh, not even Eurosceptic parties, that want to abandon the euro. And uh, so uh, this is very much part of the European frame of mind uh, for good. Um, in fact, there is no serious political party that wants to leave the EU any longer. Uh, Brexit has taught uh, us a very hard lesson and shown uh, what happens to you um, if you leave. It has been a hard school. It's a lose-lose um, uh, um, agreement for both sides in real terms. But um, uh, of course, for the UK politics, it's a different uh, uh, argument, and, but I don't go into that. And um, so in Europe, uh, the question is not about leaving the EU. The question is about how fast do we go forward? What is the pace of further integration? Uh, what is, should be the degree of further integration? And um, Dino referred to it at the start, how much should we enlarge further uh, the EU towards the countries in the Western Balkans um, and, um, and uh, in particular? So, at the end of the day, it's my conviction that um, the answer uh, 
aspect of the whether or not what we are for and um, and whether we do the job um, it essentially has to do with the capacity of the EU to produce solutions uh, for our citizens uh, solutions that uh, are not possible uh, if you work exclusively at the level of member states individually uh, solutions uh, in the economy and in migration in climate in uh, fighting crime and in um, and in defending the EU interests in common interest internationally and that is of course especially now uh, a very very important point um, but we reflect on ourselves and in fact just a couple of weeks ago um, the EU has begun what is called the Conference on the Future of Europe. Now, it's a very existential sort of title. Um, and um, I don't think um, it will, <laughs> the answer will be, there is no future, no. But the question, the answer will have to be on what member states, what citizens want the EU to do. So this is a very open process. Um, consultation, bottom-up, everybody can contribute, also non-EU citizens, so uh, their colleagues uh, feel free, look at the website, and if you wish to contribute, um, do so. Now, but I close by uh, referring back to Europe Day and um, our birthday, and I come back to the the declaration by Robert Schumann that um, I mentioned and Dina mentioned earlier on. And I think there's no better, in my view, a few better ways than the one uh, he put it. And I believe you, um, Billy, you mentioned it as well. And he said, and I'm quoting, world peace cannot be safeguarded without the making of creative efforts, creative, um, efforts that are proportionate to the dangers which threaten it. Yeah, proportionality. Um, not overreach, but not underreach um, either. Um, and the second thing he said is, uh, Europe will not be made all at once or according to a single plan. It will be built through concrete achievements uh, which first create a de facto solidarity. Now, I think there you have it, uh, the whole philosophy or uh, approach uh, <clears throat> behind it. And I think uh, what he said in 1950 was true then, and it remains true for the EU uh, uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Finsen, for your strong message from uh, by quoting Schumann, uh, especially about creativity, about uh, being proportionate and solidarity, and uh, that is the things that we are Europe or in the United, uh, sorry, the European Union that we know uh, today. And of course, we look forward to hear your thoughts, Ambassador, on the the EU uh, future conference uh, later on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving to the question and answer session. Uh, Ambassador, we have received so many questions. For the, even for the first batch only, we have received 35 questions uh, coming from Surabaya, from Jakarta, from Bali, from Makassar, uh, Ambassador, even from uh, Sumatra as well. Now, uh, since we have a uh, fairly limited time, I will be selecting a few uh, of the most interesting questions to ask to Ambassador Vincent. The first question comes uh, from Anissa from Makassar. Uh, she is a member of FPCI chapter Universitas Hasanuddin. Her question is, uh, dear Ms. Ambassador, as the Green Deal is currently one of the most prominent policies in the EU, how does the EU maintain its objectives and goal despite of the pandemic? Please, Ambassador. Um, <coughs> thanks. Um, it's not um, a matter of, of choosing any longer. Uh, it's, uh, you know, let's, let's face it, the climate crisis is there. Um, it's not doing or not um, 
doing a green policy is, is no longer an option. It is a necessity. And um, the, um, uh, the science tells it. What we see around us in nature says it. Uh, the, the disasters, the natural disasters, the uh, extreme weather events, everything, the glaciers, everything. Um, and the politics says it. Um, European politics has become green. It's, it's, uh, the green policies is no longer the remit of the green parties. And uh, by the way, watch the German elections of uh, later this year. There might be a green party uh, in, in the top two uh, of the uh, outcome of the election. Uh, so the, Europe's policies have become green. Our recovery policy is a green one. There's a, a minimum spending requirement uh, of the EU funding, 30% for green uh, aspects. And, um, uh, and uh, but countries will do more. Um, Let's very interesting. Uh, three days ago in Germany, the court ruled in favor of a suit filed by young people who had complained uh, that the government policy was not green and ambitious enough. And that as a result, the, the current generation was pushing the buck to the future generation and the young people were going to pay the bill. And the, the court ruled in favor of that suit. So the German government will now have to go back to some of uh, to the drawing board of some of the policies and, and, uh, and amend. Now, I don't know if this is going to be a trend <laughs> of lawsuits across the EU, but it just goes to show how far this has now been ingrained in European lawmaking and European thinking and in European jurisprudence. One other indicator, uh, Volkswagen, uh, the largest car maker in Europe, uh, equal to uh, more than Toyota. Uh, 2030, they have said, they will produce only electric vehicles, so gone the diesels, gone uh, the petrol uh, or the LPG uh, cars, electric vehicles. Now they're the first and I'm sure that they will not be the last. So we have, we are going to see this year a tremendous, tremendous turnaround in the, of, uh, at the political as well as the business uh, level uh, for sure. Okay, thank you Ambassador Vincent. Now we have another question from Azam. Azam is a member of FPCI chapter Erlanga from Surabaya. Uh, his question is, uh, how would the EU bridge the development with global South partners, uh, especially regarding climate standards, such as uh, with palm oil and other communities? Please, Ambassador. Um, in essence, of course, there are two ways. Uh, first of all, the, um, in the UN, uh, the global uh, climate talks process, there is this um, amount of funding foreseen uh, for financial help by the richer countries to the uh, developing countries, um, target of 100 billion um, euros per year. Um, I don't think we have achieved that amount of global funding yet, uh, but we will have to, if we're serious in about, uh, about our, our promise. Um, what I, I, I've now, the, the amount of the, given by the EU, it slips my mind for a second, but uh, I do know that we are the number, the single biggest donor of climate funding uh, to the developing uh, and emerging world uh, uh, globally. Uh, so our commitment uh, stands. So that's track one. The second track is the bilateral development and uh, policy exchange. <clears throat> and let's face it, uh, the, the EU has been doing this greening of our economy for, for three decades now, and um, uh, roughly. Uh, we have tons and tons of know-how and, and, and best practice about what worked in our continent and, and what did not. Uh, not everything was a success. 
um, but um, uh, and we, we are able to make available that know-how, um, which doesn't mean that what, you, what we did in Europe can be photocopied uh, um, just like that. No, uh, of course, the circumstances are different, but uh, there are certainly um, errors that uh, the emerging countries can avoid uh, through a dialogue know uh, and a know-how exchange. And uh, we are totally committed to, to doing that also here in Indonesia. Uh, we hope to start uh, before too long an exchange about um, uh, uh, carbon pricing and uh, about the uh, emission trading system. Okay, thank you very much, Ambassador. I'm sure know how exchange is not about imitating, but also about adapting and improvising. So, uh, thank you very much for your answer. Now we have another question, Ambassador, from Fanny. Uh, she is from Makassar. Uh, her question is, when will Europe open its border again? I think uh, Fanny wants to travel uh, soon, Ambassador, that's why I should ask again. Listen, Ambassador. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic uh, question. I think everybody is keen uh, to travel and, uh, and uh, yeah, if, if funny, uh, two answers. First of all, if you're a student, um, which may be the case, uh, I can tell you that the EU's borders have remained open all along. Uh, so there's a special provision in our law saying that uh, students and researchers um, can enter the EU for, uh, for that activity without uh, um, problem. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, of course, testing and all of that, but that's commonplace by now. Um, the second answer is we just have to be a little bit patient, I, I believe. Um, there are so many uncertainties still around for international travel. Um, countries are also Indonesia and, and rightly um, are very cautious uh, about it. Uh, of course, uh, Indonesia wants to open up Bali and, um, and <laughs> we would like that too. Uh, and, uh, but it's, the moment has not just not yet come at the, but, and we should, um, but certainly we will work towards that. We will try and see how we can uh, create maybe not these travel bubbles uh, between Indonesia and, and Europe. That's, that's probably not very practical for, for such a large region, but, but at least take some of the elements and, and see how we can best and fastest uh, move, move forward. So Fanny, I sympathize with you, uh, but bear with us a little bit. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, now we have another question from Yasmin. Yasmin uh, is a member of Aktisia Chapter University Pajajaran. So she is from Bandung. Uh, her question, uh, how could the mechanism of EU SEPA be a significant strategy to accelerate international development cooperation between the EU and Indonesia? Please, Ambassador. Well, the, the, the SEPA is, is about trade and about uh, trading goods and in, in services, and it is about investment. And um, <clears throat> so it's not about cooperation necessarily. Um, what we're doing is, is, uh, is nevertheless provide money to help companies here in Indonesia prepare for uh, you know, selling on the, on the European market. We have tough standards sometimes, uh, quality, health, safety, etc., chemicals. Um, uh, and uh, we know that some companies have difficulty meeting those standards now, but what we've said, we will help them and so that they can benefit from the agreement uh, later on. Um, the second thing is, and, uh, you know, I, I refer to a figure of, of a GDP benefit uh, resulting from the agreement um, uh, as uh, from the SEPA agreement for Indonesia, 5 billion uh, euros per year, extra GDP year after year. Now that is massive. And now how does that come about? It's a, it comes about thanks to private initiative. Uh, the, if you create a level playing field a liberalized level playing field with safeguards for health, uh, consumer protection, uh, uh, labor standards, etc. 
this is not wild west uh, uh, capitalism uh, like in the early 2000s if you do create such a framework between the two partners then private sector will follow private sector will come they will invest and there is no need uh, for development uh, money and that is i think that the big um, point i want to make we need to give the private sector the chance uh, to <clears throat> to do their work they will do their work because that's what they're after uh, that's their goal uh, to do business to invest to make a profit uh, um, for their shareholders etc uh, so let the private sector do the work. By the way, uh, that comes back to the uh, also the question from Assam in Surabaya. Also in the green agenda, in green technology, in green investment, in renewable energy, the lesson learned in Europe is that if you have your re regulatory framework is good, if you set yourself a target, but by 2050, I want to be climate neutral, then this will give the private sector the sort of investment horizon they need uh, to take their decisions. And they will invest, they will develop the research, do the research, develop the technologies and so on. Uh, so that is uh, certainly also a dimension that I think uh, will be a major spin-off uh, from the, the SEPA for Indonesia. Hey, thank you, Ambassador. I hope uh, that answers Yasmin's question. Now we have another interesting question, Ambassador. This is from Rex. Uh, she, he is from Udayana University, Bali. Uh, he's asking, Ambassador Vincent, in your opinion, what makes the European Union works as an international organization? What can the other unions or associations learn from the EU in achieving such integration? Please, Ambassador. Uh, that's a that's a very good question, and there's a, you know you will find different answers to that question, of course, and and um, and long ones, and I will be brief. <laughs> so, you know, at the end of the day, it is um, it's about commonality of values uh, among your members. Um, it's about commonality of purpose. Um, domestically uh, and internationally uh, between your members and it's about having a good legal framework with strong institutions the court of justice which is you know very strong very respected uh, with a strong central bank ecb is the a very respected institution um, with a um, uh, other institutions that give people confidence that uh, their wishes are listened to and that the actions are accounted for uh, to by uh, the uh, those in in the leadership um, and lastly it requires a sense of uh, compromise and, uh, you know, if you're with 27 countries, uh, there are differences. And that, that's not bad at all. That, that is simply how, how it is. Uh, there, are, uh, there are differences between human beings and still they can be good friends. Um, so, uh, but it requires a willingness of compromise and say, okay, I accept your point. I can compromise on my interest. Uh, for the sake of the common goal, and if then, and, and also, I hope that you will listen to my interest next time round. Uh, so it is that sort of play uh, that happens uh, day in day out, and that is uh, something I think that colleagues may not realize that how intense the intra-EU um, consultation is in, in Brussels, in the Council of Ministers, uh, the number of working groups between all member states with the European Commission, with the um, uh, other institutions, uh, with the Parliament, etc. That consultation is so intense and has been there for so long uh, that we know each other so very well and we know what's possible and what is not possible and at the end of the day, 
in the large, large majority of cases, we manage to find a common ground as member states and whether it's for domestic matters and for, for foreign policy. So and that, that's, that's, that's good. All right, thank you very much, Ambassador Vincent. I was just in, uh, got informed by the committee that we got 24, 20 uh, more minutes extra, Ambassador, for the question and answer. So, ladies and gentlemen, I encourage all of the, uh, our audience who are watching from YouTube to submit as many questions as you like in the live chat box because uh, we will still uh, doing the question and answer session with Ambassador Vincent Dicat. Uh, now, Ambassador, following Rex's question, uh, this is Ronsina from Jakarta. She is asking, after the Brexit and now the pandemic, how can the EU remain optimistic about the continuation of European integration process? Well, um, <laughs> first of all, I, I think the, the pandemic um, Yes, it is a depressing thing, but um, depression doesn't help if you, if, if you have to find solutions. Uh, so you have to, um, in fact, to recognize that as uh, we need the EU more now um, that for finding the solutions that, uh, that we need than, than, than before. So, and uh, the needs of citizens has, has brought us together on a topic of health as, as EU in a way that we've never seen before. And our adaptiveness, our capacity to adjust uh, and our flexibility is I think something that gives, makes me optimistic that the EU can continue to deliver uh, what it needs with all the, the problems and weaknesses. You know, this, this is not a perfect world. I'm not saying that, but but still, uh, we hang together, uh, we do things together, and at the end of the day, we deliver a lot. And um, the opinion polls, uh, the trust, the rising trust among, um, among the population is, 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 is an indicator. It's not high enough, huh? <laughs> so we still have a way to go, uh, but uh, certainly. And on Brexit, I think, <laughs> I think I've spoken about, about it, and I think that... Um, the taste for a, an exit scenario among the existing member states has, has declined massively <laughs> uh, after um, the current Brexit. So I don't think we, are, we could be concerned about that so much. Okay, we have another question, Ambassador, uh, regarding uh, the European Union and its members. This is a question from Nanes. Nanes is asking, uh, Mr. Vincent, from the recent news that I've seen and uh, the talks that have been going on uh, for a long time, uh, my question to you, Ambassador, is it possible for Turkey to join the European Union in the future? And uh, we also noticed that uh, there are a few countries that are queuing to be a member of the European Union as well. So are we going to see a new member of the European Union soon, Ambassador? Um. It's a, it's, a, it's a very good question, and it's one of the most difficult questions uh, we, we have um, regarding Turkey. Uh, of course, the promise of um, the perspective of, um, of uh, joining the EU was, 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 was offered long ago. Uh, we are negotiating, but um, unfortunately, uh, we have seen that um, the, the politics of, uh, in Turkey um, have gone in a direction that is just not compatible with a, an accession process. And our uh, negotiations about membership have simply got stuck, have not moved, and, um, and our relations are, are, are somewhat troubled. Um, we will make the effort, we continue, uh, as you know, uh, the EU leadership visited Ankara uh, not too long ago and um, to try and make that effort uh, to say to Turkey, you are uh, a, a strategic partner for us um, in that part of the world. Um, we need stability in that part of the world. Uh, Turkey could uh, offer that and um, let's, let's, let's engage. 
so the jury is still out, uh, I must say, uh, but of course, fundamentally, strategically, uh, we have we will continue to see um, Turkey in a in a uh, in a European uh, uh, co context. Uh, other countries in the enlargement uh, with uh, with um, we're negotiating with uh, Montenegro. We are negotiating with uh, North Macedonia, and um, uh, we have started also with Serbia, um, Bosnia not yet. Um, <coughs> yeah, one day uh, Albania is not uh, also. Um, uh, you know, this is uh, work for the long haul. Um, we have, uh, we know we will have to build the institutions of all countries concerned. Uh, they have to meet the standards. Uh, Dr. Dino mentioned it, our standards are tough. And um, the need for coherence uh, in the EU requires uh, that we have to keep up uh, uh, the level of compliance and support um, institutionally as well as politically. We have to ins uh, be able to rely uh, on the foreign policy orientations of, of, of countries and um, um, that uh, we can continue to work in a common foreign policy and not with um, a common foreign policy plus one or two. Uh, so that is, that is the sort of question we have for the coming years. And, um, and yeah, we will proceed on that track of accession you know, on a case-by-case, merit-based uh, uh, sort of framework. Thank you, Ambassador. Moving on, we have a question from Junior Do from FDCI UPN Veteran Yogyakarta. Uh, his question, could you tell us a bit about carbon trading EU? How far has it affected the world? And are there any new breakthroughs related to carbon trading during this pandemic? Well, um, the EU was the, I think, the inventor of carbon trading uh, and of the emission trading scheme. And um, it has the system, it's been around for, for a good 20, 25 years now, has simply revolutionized um, the way we go about cleaning industry. Um, it has generated tremendous, tremendous money from the industry for uh, technological innovation, for reducing um, CO2, for increasing energy efficiency, etc. So our ex experience is extremely, extremely positive uh, with it. Um, we need uh, private sector investment for cutting CO2. Uh, it is inconceivable that all these investments can come uh, from the public sector, from governments, from state budgets, inconceivable, um, but also undesirable uh, in many ways. At the end of the day, it's better uh, that business invests. They must take the responsibility as well. Uh, so uh, that's why we are so keen to have this discussion also with Indonesia about common pricing and carbon um, uh, emissions trading system. Uh, we, we, are, we, are, we are convinced that this might, might work here. Um, has COVID changed anything of that? For us, no. Uh, uh, the system works and our policy is very constant. If anything, um, our climate uh, and uh, green ambitions have, have increased rather than decreased um, uh, over the past year, uh, notwithstanding the COVID. Thank you, Ambassador. That's uh, really uh, great to hear. Now we have a question from Adam uh, from Ministry of Law and Human Rights. His question, has there been uh, a strategic plan uh, or something from EU to uh, respond to Poland and Chechnya uh, regarding the human rights violations there? Sorry, I just didn't catch what you said the last bit. Uh, 
has there been a strategic plan or something from EU regarding Poland and Chechnya uh, regarding the human rights violation that's happening there? Um, there is a, a procedure ongoing uh, with um, uh, regarding the um, Court of Justice, the Supreme Court uh, of Poland. The EU believes that the provisions decided um, do not comply with uh, norms about the independence of the court and the judiciary um, of, and the judges, that their selection is not guaranteed to be um, <coughs> independent. So th this is a, 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 an issue that we're discussing right now. It's ongoing, so there's not much I, I can say about it at the moment. Okay, Ambassador. Uh, now we have a question from Firsa. Um, Firsa is from PT Putra in Indo Tanaga. Uh, her question is, uh, Ambassador Piquet, is it possible to apply EU model cooperation to ASEAN? And if you want, uh, would you give us uh, your opinion uh, about what is happening uh, in the military coup data uh, in Myanmar? Only if you want to comment on that. Well, on the second point, uh, the, um, the EU adopted a, a statement just, when was it, yesterday or the day before? I forget now. Um, <coughs> um, following the ASEAN leaders meeting um, of, a, of a week ago. I'll summarize it. Uh, first of all, strong support for ASEAN, uh, its role, uh, its activism, uh, and um, the ASEAN en envoy um, to um, mediate support for the ASEAN humanitarian uh, center activities. We, co we cooperate with that center. Um, for the, the, the humanitarian aid that the EU is providing to the, um, uh, the most vulnerable population in, uh, in Myanmar. Um, and that is regarding ASEAN and the other statement, part of the statement is very much uh, a, uh, a call on the, on the junta to, uh, to stop uh, the, the, the deadly violence and to uh, uh, release uh, the detained political prisoners and uh, uh, re-establish the functioning of the democratic institutions. Um, this, this first question about uh, can, can the EU be a model or for ASEAN? You know, um, in, in each situation, each uh, country, each regional grouping is, is different. And so models, um, it's, it's, a, it's a, a term that I think is not the right one. Um, can it be an inspiration? Yes, for sure. And, um, and, and it's not only just me saying that, but I think that many um, representatives uh, from the ASEAN member states, from the ASEAN secretariats will say the same, that the way EU has, uh, has integrated and has come about in political, economic uh, policy areas, is something that ASEAN can learn something from, both in terms of what um, you know, what went well and what is uh, what is project productive, but also things to avoid. And, and ASEAN is not the same um, as is the EU. Uh, uh, Dr. Dinas put it very clearly uh, at the start of this. Uh, there's more diversity um, in, amongst the ASEAN membership than in the EU's, and. Um, so um, inspiration is certainly possible. In fact, um, we do a lot of work with ASEAN <coughs> in you know, more, more the political side, but certainly also the very practical side uh, of uh, cooperation and um, basically to create, to create concrete steps forward for ASEAN action in customs, in transport, in aviation, in climate, uh, we just ran also a, a, a seminar uh, about uh, COVID vaccines. Um, 
so all, all these things, uh, practical steps uh, that allow uh, the ASEAN members to find out what they can achieve together and uh, what they wish to achieve together and so on. So we are we're very supportive of the process, uh, inspiration, we're happy to be a model. Let's not <laughs> talk in those terms. Okay, thank you very much, Ambassador. Now we have a question uh, about COVID-19 and vaccine, Ambassador. Uh, could you tell us a bit about uh, the development of vaccine for COVID-19 in the European Union? And uh, uh, is it true that the EU has banned COVID-19 vaccine export to outside EU? Uh, if so, uh, would it be uh, affecting the relationship between Indonesia uh, and EU in the health sector? Please, Ambassador. <coughs> Thanks. Um, I uh, we have uh, our vaccine policy is 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 in uh, is in motion, uh, and uh, we have seen a, a lot of acceleration in the supply side and the deployment, the logistics, and um, and the administ administering of the of the vaccines. I think uh, we are feel a lot more reassured that we're on the right track uh, now. Uh, than, than two months ago when things were pretty uh, difficult, major problems of supply sourcing, contracts were broken, etc. Um, so, um, and uh, as I mentioned, we hope that we uh, will be able to achieve herd uh, immunity uh, by uh, August, uh, July, August uh, this, this, this year. 70% um, vaccinated uh, of our adult population. Um, our cooperation uh, with Indonesia is, I think, a positive one. Um, we um, uh, concretely, we work with through COVAX, uh, where we are the, the major donor, uh, make a single donor. And uh, we're very happy that COVAX um, has, uh, is providing Indonesia with uh, vaccines as well. So secondly, certainly we would like to uh, be interested in going beyond that. Uh, we, through uh, collaboration between the pharmaceutical companies, possibly, and uh, also later on uh, through the provision of, uh, of, um, of vaccines that uh, are uh, not uh, that are we have bought but won't need immediately, um, but are and could be uh, made available to third countries. The third thing uh, I, I should say is that okay, we are vaccinating now. Now that's great, and and um, Indonesia, EU, same. Um, but you know, how long will this crisis last? Um, we we are, have to. Uh, take, um, uh, assume the possibility, if not likelihood, uh, that we have to keep on vaccinating uh, against this, uh, this virus. Uh, in the way uh, you're also vaccinating, or people are vaccinating themselves against the common flu. Uh, so we will need to set up a, a lasting capacity of manufacturing capacity um, uh, for vaccines uh, around the world. and. Uh, this is largely private sector driven, of course, um, but the, I, I feel that um, uh, public authorities uh, in, in Europe uh, and in Asia, including Indonesia, have definitely got a role to play there. Thank you, Ambassador. Now we have a question from Agung Vijayanto, who is uh, coming from Dasin uh, Institute. Uh, his question uh, is that uh, racism issue is on the rise on the in the world, uh, how determined is EU in fighting racism issue? Difficult problem, um, indeed. Um, um, the uh, um, main dimension that I would see in, in, in Europe has to do with uh, the rather strong um, um, irregular uh, migration that Europe has, has witnessed uh, in the past five years, let's say, 2015 and after, and which has c 
created tremendous problems uh, for not only for the um, irregular migrants, uh, but also for uh, our societies. Um, there is a um, sense that um, uh, the migrants um, who came to Europe have not always um, been able to integrate in, in, into our society, not been able or not been willing. Um, uh, just the other day, the EU adopted um, a new policy paper about precisely that problem, about integration and assimilation. Um, and if that doesn't work, about repatriation and, and um, uh, cooperation with uh, the sending countries or the countries of origin, I should say, uh, of, um, of groups, minority groups, um, migrant groups who uh, just cannot or do not want, wish to uh, assimilate. Um, so this is a major topic. Um, I think even today, uh, um, the problem of migration is there. Uh, day after day, uh, you will see smaller boats um, landing on the shores of, uh, of Spain, of Portugal, of Italy, um, with people from Northern Africa, uh, North African countries. Um, it means that there continues to be not only the, the, the pool of the EU, of the, the, the wealthy neighbor in the north, uh, but also the push of, of conflict, of poverty uh, in the south. So our approach will very much continue to be uh, development of institutions in those countries, um, uh, the economic development, job creation in those countries, and of course, uh, the <clears throat> support for uh, uh, crisis mitigation, crisis mediation in regions like the, the Sahel, uh, where there has been a, a, a horrible uh, security problem for, for far too long um, as a result of extremism and, 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 and so forth. So, um, in, uh, in short, a combined approach for us uh, between domestically uh, assimilation uh, where we can in the society, in the economy, um, and secondly, um, uh, working with uh, the countries of origin um, in, uh, in Northern Africa and other, other parts. Thank you, Ambassador. I was informed by the committee that the time is up. However, I would like to ask you one this uh, last question from Radin, who is a member of FPCI Universitas Muhammadiyah Malang. His question, I would like to ask Ambassador Vincent, what uh, is the Europe Day means for the European uh, Union member of states to you? And why is it important for the world? And why is it important for? For the world, Ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um... For the world, uh, I'd say, um, I think the world is better off with a strong and stable uh, European Union than without it. Um, we are a trustworthy partner. We are a stable partner. We are a partner for the long run uh, for everybody, uh, including for Indonesia. Uh, no sh short term game is uh, termism in our, in our goals steadiness and work together, um, global matters, um, bilateral matters. So I think the world is better off with us than without. Just do the, as I said, a thought experiment uh, of what would happen if there was no EU left, uh, you know, tomorrow. And, and uh, would, would that make it easy for, uh, easier for Indonesia uh, to maintain relations with Europe or not, and um, uh, and, and others, of course. Um, um, whereby I certainly do not say that the EU replaces the member states. No, that's not uh, the case. The member states is what we work for. Uh, they are uh, our members. Uh, they set 
the guidance and, and, and the base um, make the decisions. But together we can work um, uh, and to get uh, for common goals and also in the foreign policy for the world. Uh, so that's one part. The second uh, question is so first, but what does it mean for me personally? Now, I, I, I'll tell you this, that um, I, I belong to the generation who can still remember how it was before. Um, I was born in the Netherlands, in the east of the country, not far from the German border. And uh, on occasion, uh, with, uh, with the family, with parents, we went to the other side of the border uh, in our old Ford Cortina, a car that doesn't exist for sure. And the whole notion alone of going abroad um, was, was exciting, uh, uh, crossing the border. And when you then get, got to the border, now what you have to do is uh, customs on the Dutch side, the border police on the Dutch side, the border police on the German side, and the customs on the um, German side, checking the documents, opening the boots to see whatever was in, was in there, uh, etc. Now, that is still what I can remember. And if I now cross that same border at that same spot, um, as I said it a year ago, um, it is, yes, the language changes. But other than that, uh, it is as if you are in one and the same place and you belong together and there's no hassle uh, with passports and, 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 and whatnot. Um, and um, it gives you a tremendous sense of freedom and I think of security, uh, to know that you live next door to a neighbor uh, whom you can trust and who trusts you. And because of that trust, uh, the citizens benefit. And I think that is for me a, a very uh, personal sense of satisfaction. And, and that's why I'm happy uh, to be doing this talk for on the occasion of the Europe Day celebration activities in uh, Indonesia um, uh, this year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Vincent Bicat, for answering the uh, many, many questions that we have received from our YouTube live chat. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have received uh, so many questions. Uh, however, due to the time limitation, we are only able to answer some of your uh, questions. But do not be saddened because I have two good news for you. Uh, you can ask your question every day from Monday to Saturday during uh, the next week in our uh, Europe Virtual Talks uh, series, Road to uh, Europe Day 2021. We will have ambassadors and representatives of uh, 10 European countries who are ready to respond to your curiosity at Ask Ambassador Anything at every, uh, sorry, uh, every 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. at our YouTube channel. And... Uh, uh, the second good news that I have for you, gentlemen, is that uh, the European Union has prepared many prizes for you today. And uh, of course, throughout the week also, we have uh, prepared uh, many interesting prizes for you. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let us uh, move to the next section, which is the quiz. As I have mentioned before, ladies and gentlemen, the question, uh, sorry, the, the quiz will be played on Kahoot platform. I am sure many of you are already familiar with Kahoot. However, I'd like to remind you uh, the, to uh, use a second screen or use uh, your phone to play uh, Kahoot with us. To play with, uh, the Kahoot, ladies and gentlemen, please go to your browser and enter Kahoot, uh, sorry, www.kahoot.it. And then uh, you uh, shall put your campaign, and the campaign would be uh, seven, nine, uh, uh, the previous, are you please? Okay, nine, seven, three, three, zero, three, seven. Once again, the campaign is nine, seven, three, three, zero, three, seven. Okay, and next, are you? Now, uh, after you put in the uh, gameplay, ladies and gentlemen, you shall put your name. However, uh, for your nickname, uh, please put in your order number 
as your nickname. The order number can be found in your ticket, uh, which uh, has been sent to you through email uh, from uh, even right. Uh, this is how the order number should look like. And in your email, the order uh, number should look like this. All right. Now we are waiting uh, for all of the participants to join uh, Kahoot. I think uh, I'll give uh, several minutes, maybe a couple of minutes for all of the people to join Kahoot. Yes, we already have 37, 38 people. Please, ladies and gentlemen, we will be waiting for you. Please put in your order number as your nickname to join the Kahoot team. Once again, the order number can be found in your ticket, uh, which has been sent to you through email uh, from Evan Wright. Yes, your order number can be found in your email and on your ticket that has been sent upon registering to this event. Okay, we have now 50 people who are uh, already joining Kahoot. We'll still be waiting for more people who wish to join the quiz today because uh, the European Union has prepared very, very interesting uh, prizes for three winners, for three winners uh, from Kahoot. Ladies and gentlemen, the Kahoot is a game of uh, speed and brains and uh, the European Union has prepared eight uh, very uh, intriguing questions uh, about European Union and uh, three people will uh, get prizes from the European Union. Therefore, uh, we encourage everyone to take out your phone, to put in the game pin at kahoot.it and uh, using uh, the order number from your ticket from Even Bright uh, to be your nickname to join the game. All right, shall we start? Yes, we have more than 50 people who are joining the Kahoot right now. All right, let us begin. Please, the committee. Our first question. Yes, uh, shall we begin? All right, apparently we have uh, a bit of technical difficulties, but we will uh, start playing out soon. Again. All right, the committee is giving uh, more time for people to join the Kahoot. And uh, once again, I'd like to remind you, ladies and gentlemen, to put in the, the game pin at www.kahoot.it and uh, you shall be uh, filling out the column with your nickname. However, instead of a nickname, you shall put your order confirmation number as your nickname. The order confirmation number could be found in your ticket that has been sent to you uh, upon registration uh, to this event. Again, ladies and gentlemen, there will be prizes uh, that has been prepared by the European Union delegation uh, to Indonesia. We will be uh, giving out three uh, prizes to the top three winners who are uh, who will be answering questions through Kahoot. The European Union has prepared uh, eight uh, questions, eight intriguing questions uh, regarding European Union, Europe Day, and uh, those of you who answered the 
faster and answer uh, correctly will be uh, given the uh, largest score. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I was uh, informed that there is a new pin. Once again, there is a new pin uh, for the Kahoot. And the uh, uh, new game pin is 5320454. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, please uh, log in to kahoot.it and enter the new game pin, which is uh, 5320454. And uh, once again, for your nickname, ladies and gentlemen, please your, uh, use your order confirmation number, which you can find in your uh, email that has been sent through uh, uh, Eventbrite when you're registering to this event. Yes, we have more people coming in. As of now, we have 25 people who have joined Kahoot. All right, we'll be waiting for more people. Once again, I'd like to uh, remind you to uh, join to Kahoot via www.kahoot.it and the game pin would be 5320454. Once again, your nickname shall be uh, the order confirmation number which you can find in your email that has been sent uh, sorry, in the email that has been sent uh, from Eventbrite when you're registering for the event. Yeah. All right. We have now 60 people and we are going to start the Kahoot right now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please focus on your phone as the question will be shown on your phone. The first question, how many official languages are there in the EU? Yes, we got 54 answers, wow. 50, sorry, 15 percent have answered correctly. All right, our second question. What is the EU anthem? Remember, ladies and gentlemen, this is a game of speed and brain. So people who answer faster will get a higher point. All right. Now for the third question. How often are EU elections held? Now we are moving to the fourth question. How many people are estimated to live in the EU? I'm sure there are many people who live in the EU, but how, how many are there to be specific? Yes, and the answer is 447 million. We're moving to the fifth question. Which of the following non EU countries uses euro as an official currency? Three, two, one. And the answer is Andorra, Fabian City, and Monaco. 
We're moving to the sixth question. How many stars are there on the EU flag? Well, I'm seeing five right now in front of me, but is it there? <laughs> Three, two, one. And the answer is 12. We're moving to the second question. Europe Day celebrates a declaration made on 9th May 1915. What is the declaration called? I think Ambassador Vincent has mentioned this declaration in his uh, lecture report. Okay, there's five seconds left. And the answer is Schumann Declaration. All right, we're moving to the last question, ladies and gentlemen. How many countries are part of the EU? Is it 12, is it 15, 27, or 28? And the answer is 27. Congratulations to those of you who have answered correctly. Now let us see the podium, ladies and gentlemen. The third place goes, uh, the third, second, and the first place uh, will be shown in the podium. Please, ladies and gentlemen, shall you be the winner? Take a screenshot of uh, the screen and uh, use it as a proof for your uh, winning. And ladies and gentlemen, I would kindly ask you, uh, for those of you who have uh, win and shown uh, the order confirmation number on the screen uh, to contact our staff immediately after the quiz to claim your prizes by uh, providing your personal details and screenshot of this code to uh, our staff uh, through Instagram DM. Once again, uh, for those of you who have won the card game, please contact our staff immediately and uh, 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 please provide us with your personal details and the screenshot of your Kahoot winning through Instagram direct message. Ladies and gentlemen, and uh, with that, we've come to the end of the quiz. Once again, I'd like to say congratulations to all of the winners. I would also like to thank Ambassador Vincent Picat for your valuable time. And on behalf of FPCI, we extend uh, our gratitude to the delegation of the European Union to Indonesia, and of course to you, Ambassador Vincent Picat. And we would like also uh, to thank all of the participants who have joined today's event and participated in our game. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that we still have several Ask Ambassador Ending sessions that is part of the Europe uh, Virtual Talks Road to Europe Day 2021 series that will be starting from Monday and uh, uh, will be going, going on until the 8th of May. Uh, for more information about uh, this event, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, visit bit.ly slash Europe Virtual Talks. Once again, it's bit.ly slash Europe Virtual Talks. On Monday, ladies and gentlemen, we have His Excellency Olivier Chambard, Ambassador of France to Indonesia, who will be speaking at 10 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. And uh, on the same day, ladies and gentlemen, we will also have Mr. David Van Leert, uh, who is the Deputy Head of Mission from Embassy of Belgium in Jakarta. And his session will be starting at 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Please, once again, uh, to register, you can click on bit.ly slash Talks. I think uh, we have reached the very end of our event, ladies and gentlemen. I once again thank you, and we hope uh, to see you in our future event. Have a very good afternoon, everyone. Could have been Ashley, awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> all the best. All the best to everybody. Stay safe. All the best to you, Ambassador. And see you on the closing session as well, Ambassador. <laughs>